my teammate uh, was in court today and he's uh, not here, so we're not going to be talking about the border crossing um, point, but we will focus um, on impaired driving and workplace drug testing. And so we'll start with impaired driving. So um, we all know that um, uh, consuming cannabis can uh, affect the way that you feel and um, it can impair a person's ability to drive. So it can impact your motor skills, your reaction time, your memory and concentration, and reduce the ability uh, to make decisions. And so there's been a lot of um, uh, studies, and you might see some of these on the subway. They're uh, encouraging people to come out and volunteer to go in driving simulators. But there's a lot of concern about uh, people's ability to drive um, under the influence. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, cannabis impairs individuals differently, and this can depend on the quantity that's consumed, the type, um, the variety of cannabis, uh, your tolerance off, obviously, and then also like the manner in which you consume it. So edibles have a different impact on, on you than uh, if, you, if you smoke it, like our, our friends here. Um, so how are we uh, addressing these issues? So uh, there's some criminal code offenses for impaired driving. Uh, there's the section 253, so this is uh, just a general offense to operate a motor vehicle while impaired by a drug or alcohol. And also we have some new uh, criminal code provisions that uh, recently introduced. And so these create three new offenses. And these are tied to the concentration of THC in your blood within two hours of operating a motor vehicle. And the quantities are set out in the regulations. So the, the first is a summary conviction offense. And so if you have uh, two nanograms um, but less than five nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood, you could be um, charged with the summary conviction offense or found guilty. And then there's also these uh, hybrid offenses. So these are more serious offenses that deal with higher quantity of THC. So five nanograms or more. Uh, and then also um, if you have a combination of THC and alcohol in your blood because uh, it's proven that that combination uh, um, affects impairment um, in a more serious way. Um, these offenses have um, some fines, obviously, penalties that are associated with them. So the summary conviction offense has a maximum fine of $1,000. Uh, the hybrid offenses, uh, they actually carry a minimum penalty. So your first offense is a $1,000 fine. Your second uh, is a 30-day uh, minimum imprisonment. And your subsequent uh, uh, offenses are 120 days imprisonment. Uh, and then there's also some maximum penalties that are associated. So if you um, uh, were found to be in impaired driving, uh, you would have up to 18 months imprisonment as the, as the max. Um, and um, five years if the Crown proceeded by way of indictment. And then if there's um, bodily harm involved, then the penalties can be um, greater than that. So the uh, criminal code has also um, ha now has some provisions to give police additional power so that they can actually um, charge people with these offenses. So there's um, the ability to demand a roadside saliva test. And the police just need to have a reasonable suspicion that you've consumed cannabis um, and uh, while you're driving. So you know this suspicion could be formed um, based on standard kind of observations. So maybe you're erratically driving, maybe you have some dilated pupils, maybe y you smell <laughs> like cannabis. Um, so all of those could form a reasonable suspicion and you could be asked to give uh, a saliva sample. Uh, then the saliva sample, if you, if you fail the test, if it shows that there's some THC uh, in your saliva, then you could be taken to a police station where you could be subject to a drug recognition evaluation by um, an officer or be required to provide a blood sample. And um, uh, the blood sample would then test for the level of THC because the saliva sample um, can, can't tell exactly the quantity. So this is like, pretty in intrusive, uh, obviously. Uh, there's also some provincial offenses. So 
there's now a zero tolerance policy for any THC um, for young drivers and new drivers and drivers operating motor vehicles. So if you're under the age of 21, uh, you can't have any uh, THC in your system. You're also prohibited from consuming cannabis uh, in vehicles that are being driven or at risk of being driven. So if you're caught um, uh, smoking in your car, uh, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, the zero tolerance um, provisions don't apply if you have uh, if a medical reason for consuming cannabis, but of course, if you're impaired, if there's a reason to believe you're impaired, then uh, you don't get off the hook for that. So there's, yeah, the criminal offenses would apply. So there's obviously um, some issues with, with these new rules. I mean, the first, um, first is that there's a lot of uncertainty between the relationship between THC in a person's blood and their actual level of intoxication. So this raises questions about whether there's actually a rational connection between the rule, the law, and the objective that it's trying to achieve. And so um, this makes this right for a charter challenge. So uh, Gerald's happy there. Um, there's also um, an issue about how long THC can stay in your body. So uh, it, it can stay for, for days, for, for quite a long period of time. So um, this will make it very difficult to adhere to the zero tolerance um, uh, rules. If you had uh, consumed cannabis on a Monday and went for a drive on a Friday, you might still have THC in your system. So that's gonna be um, another issue where there's likely gonna be some challenges. Another criticism or, or challenge is that the roadside testing um, devices, they have become the subject of some scrutiny. Apparently, there is a, a decent chance that you could have a positive result even though you haven't consumed any cannabis at all. And in that case, you'd be um, escorted to the police station and might be required to give a blood test. So again, uh, this is probably going to be an area where we'll see some court, um, court challenges. So overall, it, it's just going to be interesting to see what happens. And you know, uh, I'd be careful <laughs> in consuming cannabis and driving, uh, especially if you're somebody who um, uh, <laughs> doesn't have a very high tolerance. Yeah. So the, the next um, uh, topic that we're gonna talk about is just cannabis in uh, the workplace. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of issues that um, come up uh, when it comes to cannabis in the workplace, but we're just going to focus on a few of them. So uh, employers are probably um, thinking about this, right? Um, what does it mean that cannabis is legal? Does this mean that people can, employees can come to work and consume cannabis at work? Can they be impaired at work? Um, well, the answer is no, you can't be impaired at work. Um, and you also can't um, uh, do what these guys are doing in your office. Um, in, in Ontario, the legislation prohibits the um, consumption of cannabis in um, enclosed workspaces and vehicles, so you can't smoke uh, cannabis in those, uh, those locations. Also, employers do have um, the right to set rules for non-medical use of uh, cannabis and for uh, consumption of cannabis generally, just like they could for um, consumption of alcohol at work. Uh, the, the most important thing, though, is that employers um, consult with legal counsel when they're putting together these policies. And if you have a business right now, it would be uh, well advised to look at your policies, see what, what you have in place, and maybe talk to a lawyer about it just to make sure that it's compliant with uh, your human rights um, uh, obligations and with the law. So we know that employers have a duty to protect the health and safety of their employees, and it's most likely in uh, areas where there is a risk to our, oh, look at who's here, not or <laughs> wonderful, um, where there's a risk, a, a safety risk, that um, you would be inclined to be consumed about consumption. So um, what, what can you do about that if you want to try to abide by that? Well, you might think about some workplace drug testing. Well, the problem is, is that uh, workplace Drug testing is obviously very invasive, and in Canada, it's really only permissible in very limited circumstances. So there has to be a connection between the policy, the testing policy, and a, a necessary work-related purpose, and you have to show that this policy has been implemented in good faith. 
Um, and uh, so this comes up mostly in cases where you have a high risk work um, environment and there's some reasonable cause to believe that the employee is impaired. Maybe there's been an accident that you can't explain. It's not related to some malfunctioning of equipment um, or um, uh, something in those circumstances. So uh, again, like if you want to do workplace drug testing, I would consult with a lawyer and make sure that you, um, you're uh, in line with your obligations. And maybe consider other ways to test for impairment. So something like performance tests or peer monitoring um, audit work performance, all of these things are um, less intrusive means that uh, you should take. So I'm going to hand it over to Nodder now and he can um, talk about the um, border crossing issues. My apologies for being late, everyone. I was uh, protecting the rights of some cannabis innovators. Mm -hmm. oh, no, it's at the end. oh, it's at the end. Yeah. Okay. So crossing the border, fairly straightforward stuff here. Um, among these esteemed musicians, who among them is going to run into issues at the U.S. border as a result of their personal cannabis use? Well, it's, it's going to be the lone Canadian up there. Uh, that would be Justin Bieber. Uh, although uh, Miley Cyrus, Wiz Khalifa, and Snoop Dogg might have other reasons uh, for, for being uh, uh, falling under the scrutiny of U.S. Border Patrol. Um, for purposes of this presentation, it's, it's the Canadian citizen who's going to have issues. Um, uh, U.S. authorities can't prevent a U.S. citizen from entering into the United States, but they have very broad discretion to pre uh, prevent non-citizens from entering, uh, even though cannabis use, at least on a personal, for personal reasons and for personal consumption, is effectively legal in Canada here. Um, U.S. Border Patrol has been very clear that they don't care if cannabis has been effectively decriminalized in Canada. It's still a federal offense under U.S. law and, and therefore um, they're going to protect their borders and enforce federal law. Now, a number of you, no doubt, are saying, well, you know, isn't, isn't marijuana consumption and distribution legal in a number of U.S. states, including some border states uh, with Canada? If you cross the border from, Wash from uh, Vancouver to Washington, why should you have any issue crossing from one marijuana legal regime to another? Um, to understand the complexities of, of this policy from the U.S. perspective, one needs to bear in mind the hyper-politicization of cannabis in the United States. Um, during the Obama administration, there was this memo that was disseminated by uh, AG, uh, Deputy AG James Cole, uh, who reported uh, directly to AG Holder, essentially directing all U.S. federal prosecutors to not go after small-time cannabis. Uh, and the memo effectively said, we're not going to get in the way of states who want to legalize marijuana or um, make uh, marijuana uh, use more permissible. And the Cole memo essentially avoided a, a tremendous conflict of laws that was brewing south of the border. Because of course, in the US, uh, the US federal structure, you have overlapping criminal jurisdictions. You have state criminal law, uh, in many cases very permissible, if not outright legalization of cannabis laws, and you have U.S. federal law, including U.S. federal drug laws. So the Cole Memo essentially avoided a, a um, rather tricky and messy conflict of laws. But of course, um, the days of Obama are done, and we have a new U.S. Attorney General who essentially says, who essentially thinks that marijuana is the worst thing ever and uh, talks about it being a very real danger. And, uh, you know, this quote here is not the dumbest thing he's ever said about marijuana, quite frankly. The dumbest thing probably was when he said that the, uh, he used to think the KKK was all right until he found out they smoked pot. Now, in fairness to him, he claimed to have been joking when he said that. So what happens um, when um, uh, he becomes attorney general? Uh, the Cole memo is rescinded effective immediately. 
So what does that mean? What, even though some U.S. states have dismantled prohibition, cannabis remains a criminal offense federally, and the U.S. border is governed by federal law. So that, what does that mean for people with cannabis-related convictions, users, and investors? Um, for convictions, you could be out of luck entering the United States. Um, U.S. authorities generally bar people with convictions from entering the United States. Uh, anything, not all convictions uh, formally, anything that involves a crime of moral turpitude, uh, but it's, it's the U.S. government, not common sense, that dictates what's a crime of moral turpitude, and drug offenses and drug convictions are considered crimes of moral turpitude. And what about if you have a pardon? The U.S. Border Patrol and the federal authorities there have said they don't care if you get a pardon. We're not going to recognize a Canadian pardon, and they will have access to even pardoned uh, or, or uh, convictions that were subject to a record suspension because um, CBSA, our border agency, does share that CPIC information with their U.S. counterparts. So if you have a, a marijuana conviction, even a pardoned one, you'd still have to apply for a waiver um, to get into the United States. What that means for users is even an admission of use of cannabis is it could bar you entry in, in the United States. Um, you know, U.S. agents are really trying to assess whether you're a significant risk of, a, of committing that same crime in the United States. So it's not a de facto or de jure bar, but it could be a bar. And what does it mean for investors? I'll just take 10 seconds to wrap this up. Um, under U.S. federal law, anyone engaged in the marijuana, in the cannabis industry, uh, based on, on some things that US, uh, some U.S. politicians have said, is, you know, they're engaged in a criminal enterprise. So far, U.S. Border Patrol has taken a slightly more nuanced position and said, look, if we think a Canadian is going to the United States and if they're involved in the, in the cannabis, the legal cannabis industry, if they're going there to promote the interests of that business, they, that could be a bar to entry. But if they're going for their own personal reasons, um, they probably won't be found inadmissible. But a lot of thorny issues there to be worked out, and um, uh, I, I'm out of time. Thank you very much.